Thanks for joining us again at the Clive Barker Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the works and worlds of Clive Barker. In this episode, number 140, we return to Clive Barker's A to Z of Horror, uh, letters G, H, and I. So if you want to, you can pause uh, and read those chapters and watch episodes 4 and 5, and the links are in the show notes over at www. ClivebarkerCast.com, and we've got links to all the episodes on every previous show notes for the A through Z of Horror other episodes that we've done. Uh, all this plus Clive Barker news, a Kickstarter update, uh, Duels of Blood round three results, and round four is open for voting. I think that's right. No, round two results, and round three is open for voting. Sorry. Anyway, we've had a great time going through this series, and I hope you like it too. Uh, before we get to that, really quick, we'd like to remind you again uh, about our friend of the show and contributor, Don Bertram. Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination Shop is dedicated to benefiting the arts and medicine program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. Up to 50% of the proceeds will support the program where artist Don Bertram ver- uh, volunteers monthly. Please join us in donating to the program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. There's a link in the show notes over at the main website at clivebarkercast.com that will take you where you need to go to get one of his prints or art books and help out this wonderful program. Any friend of Clive Barker's is a friend of ours, and we thank Don Bertram for his support. So first of all, we've got uh, the Clive Barker's pinhead design has had a, has um, it's had a little bit of the, the the feedback on it has been a little bit mixed, I guess. I thought that, mm-hmm. that it was cool, and I think that people were focusing on the wrong thing. I mean, if when there's a link in the show notes, if you want to look at it, there were some people that were upset because Doug it wasn't Doug Bradley, and it's like, come on, this is a makeup test at a convention in California. Well, yeah, it's Monster Palooza, right? It's yeah. it's at, at the Pasadena Convention Center. Mo- Monster Palooza had a lot of different makeup designs being shown around throughout the floor, and you know, uh, I didn't go there, but I, I saw plenty of pictures, and there were some really amazing renditions of of characters there, and some really talented people doing some great makeups. Yeah. And you know, the the Pinhead one was really cool too. And people were focusing on the costume too, which I think. In my mind, the the purpose of that costume was just a kind of a plain black costume that was supposed to draw focus to the uh, to the makeup job, and it wasn't right. supposed to be like this is what he would look like. This is what his outfit would look like in a movie. Yeah, I mean, this is just this is just a showcase. So yeah. it's not this is not camera. I don't I don't suppose this was camera ready or that they actually created a full on character. Um, it seems more like, hey, let's see what we can come up with. And, you know, the makeup was done by Chris Alex and Stephen Imhoff Jr., who some of you may recognize from the guy who played uh, uh, Christopher Carrion in the book trailer for uh, Aberrat 3, yeah, yeah, I think. Aberrat 3. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they, they did a great job. Uh, the human canvas, if I can call him that, was Christian Francis, who's also working at Seraphin. And I think he looked really good. I mean, some people were complaining about, oh, he's got too much of a jawline or, you know, oh, the black eyes are so played out. But it's like, come on. That's my favorite part. Because the original Pinhead had black eyes. That's right. And I saw people in the comments saying, well, Pinhead didn't have black eyes in in Hellraiser 1. And they usually go for the poster of Hellraiser where you can see Doug Bradley's baby blues. Right. But the thing is – Do a quick Google search and grab the first image that you see. Exactly. Exactly. So it's like, yeah, okay, in the poster he's got blue eyes. And personally I kind of think that looked better. But in the movie he had black eyes. And he always had black eyes in the movie. So if it's – played, did a good job help. You know, giving him that sort of dispassionate look that he had, like when he's making the chains go into Frank at the end of the movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was just one thing that I think could have been a little better, and it's like, I, I, all right, I, I, nobody at Seraphin get mad at me. I'm just going to say a few things for feedback, which is constructive. It's I think the the, the color scheme for the makeup, the paint job, mm-hmm. looked a little too gray, too oh. grayish. And didn't have enough like uh, pop to it. Like they could have made the the you know the grid like slices, the the grooves in the makeup. They could have made them a little more bloody or something. Oh, yeah. That could have popped it a little more. It looked like it was very blacks and grays, you know. Huh. Yeah, and I think that the the 
they had said the reasoning for that was Clive had wanted the original Pinhead to be more corpse-like. Mm-hmm. Or maybe that I, was something he felt later. I don't know if he felt like that right at the time that it happened or if he just kind of thought, thought of that later after watching the movie. But Sure, I can see that. I mean, uh, it, they they do have that corpse blue kind yeah. of tone in the movie, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, there was that. Um, Jacqueline S., her will and testament, the, the, the short story from the Books of Blood, Volume 2, I believe, is mm-hmm. is going to appear in a new anthology in this summer. Uh, Behold Oddities, Curiosities, and Undefinable Wonders, which makes Excellent. it hard, hard to put a, you know, to do a, a blog title yeah. with that. But. Yeah. Well, it's Behold you know, yeah, and then with it's with audit curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is edited by Doug Murano. Um, and the cover looks really cool. Uh, yeah. Jacqueline Ness is still a, a very popular story. Unfortunately, the movie is kind of in production limbo. I, I have yeah. no, no idea if the movie is ever going to get made. The other day uh, when this story came out, it reminded me and I went over to Raven Banner on Twitter and I, I sent him a, you know, I sent him a, a post saying, Hey, you know, is anything happening with the, with the Jacqueline S movie? Oh, really? But they didn't respond. Okay. I guess they, they may respond later. It says here that, uh, the Clyde Barker story joins a growing table of contents that includes Ramsey Campbell, John F. D. Taff, Brian Kirk, Patrick Freivald, Christy Demeester, and Aaron Kemper. So uh, from all these, I've I've only read Ramsey Campbell, to be me, honest. Yeah, me too. I I only know him and Clive Barker. But um, but yeah, it's it's always nice to see a new Clive Bar- or well, an old any Clive Barker story get into an anthology because you know we want him to to stay out there and stay fresh in people's minds. Absolutely. Um, so uh, when is this coming? This summer? Uh, yeah, it was July. Let me, I got to look it up again. Okay. I'm looking at their post, uh, actually. And they, I, I'm trying to read if it's oh, going to come out. Yeah, July yes, 25th, 2017. So, yeah, it comes out July oh, thank 25th, you. 2017. Okay, so we have on the, uh, next on the news we have there's an essay in reading Stephen King. Um, yeah. yeah, and the the interesting thing about that one is uh, I when I saw that it's like that sounds so familiar, but I couldn't place it. So I asked Phil and Sarah because you know a lot of our news that you know comes from them first, and uh, she said um, yes, it was previously published in in uh, the Painter, the Creature, and the Father of Lies. So I went, okay. I, I went and grabbed that book and looked it up, and, and what it was, was a, it was a speech that he gave at, a, at a honoring Stephen King in a, at, um, at the, uh, the Canadian, Canadian Bookseller Book Association Lifetime Achievement Award presented to Stephen King in Toronto on June 8, 2007. So this was a... There you go. That's yeah. a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so this was a speech that he made that got uh, collated into a, an essay by Phil and Sarah for their book, The Painter, the Creature, and the Father of Lies, and then now reprinted mm-hmm. in this Reading Stephen King book. That's that's uh, really good. That's yeah. really good. Uh, it's, it's good to have this stuff be uh, compiled and republished for everybody who hasn't had a chance to buy that other book. Yeah, yeah, and that's a really good book. I totally recommend it for anybody. It's yeah, it's kind of like Shadows in Eden, Volume Two, in a way. Mm-hmm. It's really good. I have that, but mine is in Portugal. So voting has started for Project Greenlight, and yeah. if you remember, we we've been we've been talking about this uh, 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 real fear, uh, where people are going to be able to to make uh, some scenes for a for a short film, uh, being mentored by Clive Barker. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, they um, they even did a Twitter Q and A for the project uh, a couple of weeks back that we also covered. So the submissions have been narrowed down to ten finalists, and uh, you can vote for the one you like best. Um, so yeah, we we have it on our uh, link to go there on our uh, blog. So please go there and uh, look at the pitches and vote on your favorite. Did, did you did you watch any of them? Uh, not yet. I've oh, okay. looked through them. There's uh, Before She Dies, uh, The Fortress, Bloom, The Lure, uh, Fish Hook, 
the abandoned black eyed kids a safe word the honeymoon phase and wither so those are the 10 ones the, the website is a little weird i know we were having some trouble seeing all the finalists because uh they scroll uh horizontally on mobile but uh yeah that's yeah, so on the desktop at least for me they didn't scroll horizontally but i was i still was able to watch them all um and for me, the one before she died looked like the coolest. Before she dies, looked like the coolest one. So I ended up voting for that. Okay, uh, yeah, that definitely has some early concept art that looks really, really uh, uh, very interesting with the robots and, and and stuff. And their pitch video shows previous work that they've done in CGI, and it was really good. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they, it they feels like most of these people. Stuff. Yeah, it feels like most of these people are already uh, people who are either film students. Or who are into the film business and they already had some yeah. projects like in the drawer, that, and this is like the perfect. I, yeah, yeah. It, it, that that's what I, that was the sense that I was getting out of it too, which was a little bit of a shame. Like there were some people that were like, "Oh yeah, we, you know, we do commercials and we've done these short films that have won these international film festivals and stuff like that." It's kind of like, you know, all these poor people that put in submissions that probably didn't have any experience. It's like, well, you know, what chance did they have? Yeah, well, that's that's usually how it goes. Yeah. Like the other day, I was listening to an interview about uh, the KNB uh, special effects um, company, mm -hmm. and they had there was a school that's run by one of the guys from KNB, and they were talking about the school and stuff in a podcast. And and at the end, the guy said, "Well, you know, I mean, it's not really a school for people who don't know anything about special effects makeup. It's it's more like a school for people who already have some knowledge of it." And I was wondering to myself, well, where do the other people have to go to start learning how to model clay and, and, and mold uh, makeups and stuff? I guess they, they have to do it in, uh, in university, I guess, in college. So, yeah. Um, okay, so what's next? Oh, the, the Nightbreed Collection. So I, this is um, – they say it's coming in spring, which I'm like, hey, it's already spring, but um, – the the nightbreed collection is like a, just a bunch of different nightbreed stuff like apparel and and um, there was something like a turntable something or other that I didn't understand like. yeah they say apparel enamel pins and turntable slip mats so I don't know what a turntable slip mat is turntable slip mat huh I. Uh, turntable was in vinyl turntable? Yeah, I guess so. But I, what huh. is, is a slip mat? Sounds like sounds like the an album that sleeve that you put an album in, right? But I have no. Could be. I, I don't know. But yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, a Clive Barker. I mean, a Nightbreed T-shirt sounds pretty good to me. But um, this is Cavity Colors is the is the company that's putting these out, and you know there'll be a link in the show notes and everything. But um, I accidentally awesome. for for like one second I accidentally put like capital colors in the blog post and some guy on <laughs> some guy got really mad and said, I saw that how many colors Dan Houser what you know what's the deal and and I'm like hey you know I fixed that before you even wrote that it's just a Facebook blurb blurb didn't fix I, it I think he was just being a little flippant uh, yeah. for fun yeah I think so. kind of a joke but at first I yeah. thought well maybe he worked for them so I said hey if you work for the by the way if you work for Cav cavity colors um, Tell them that spring is already here. Yeah, yeah, that's that. That's a good point. They should they should give us so, a, a, a date release date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's that's pretty cool. Nightbreed stuff is always fun uh, when it comes out because there there's never been a big market for nightbreed stuff. Um, so uh, it's always fun to to hear that some stuff is coming out. Oh, Dark Horse Comics is going to be releasing the Dark North. And I thought the last time that we talked about this, the Dark North, uh, you or Rob had said that it was going to be a role-playing game book. Huh? Really? Yeah. I guess I wasn't uh, that much into it. Must have been Rob. Yeah, but it, it's it's not a role-playing game book. It's a it's got five stories of Norse mythology, and it's got an opening uh, or a, a an introduction by Clive Barker. Oh, that's pretty cool. So originally a Kickstarter project, the Dark North is now being released by Dark Horse Comics. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so they're reprinting it. So there's people who had the Kickstarter edition, and now there's going to be a reprint of it. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of nice. 
Um, and this one actually just came out this morning right before I, um, that's why I was like five minutes late, uh, talking about getting this started. This just came out, Gauntlet Press wants people to vote for what kind of special edition, uh, would they, would people like to see? And they said, uh, Clive Barker has suggested Mr. Be Gone, but what would you guys like? And they, they put that on their Facebook page and, and, uh, David kind of brought it to my attention because he po- he's, he posted it in the Clive Barker collector group. Yeah, and um, I think if if it were up to me, I want to see something that hasn't been published before, or something super rare like the Jump Tribe book or something like that. That those are the special editions that I look forward to the most. Okay, I would probably suggest something like the Hellbound Heart, although there's been plenty of signed editions of that, I guess. Yeah, but I don't have those. Somebody somebody posted the Hellbound Heart, and they said, "Well, you know, 2007 uh, Earthling did a really good one of that." So, so we. Don't oh, I see. I don't have that. Yeah, the the 25th anniversary. Well, Mister Begon is a, is a good book. I mean, I don't know how much yeah. extra material they have to to pad it with uh, for a special edition, but uh, yeah, it's definitely enjoyable. Got, maybe he's got drawings for Mister Begon. Oh, wouldn't that be something though? Yeah, mm-hmm. I know he made a painting once of uh, Mister Begon's um, the other demon that kind of saves him in the beginning oh, of the book. Uh, Quitoon. Katoon, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I, I remember seeing Clive do a painting once of Katoon during a public signing of Mister Be Gone. So it would be nice to have stuff like that get yeah. into the edition if they're if they're going to go with Mister Be Gone. Let's yeah. see which one they decide upon and uh, wait yeah. for that. Yeah, I mean we we still we still want to see what's going to happen with like Black is the Devil's Rainbow, or if they're going to if it's put, even going to be called that. Yeah, or whatever they're going to you know whatever they're going to do with these these uh, previously you know these 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 short stories that are either rare, never been published before, or were published in somebody else's anthology. But it'd be nice to see them all collected in a Clive Barker book. So, Gosh, I agree. I mean, yeah. there's there's a bunch of stories I haven't read yet because I just can't find the the books that they came out in. Yeah, and it, it doesn't have to be Gauntlet Press. I don't really care who releases that, but I, I definitely would want that. Or even Seraphine Inc. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so you can send your suggestions to gauntlet66 at AOL.com or use the contact form on the Gauntlet Press website in the subject mention Barker Books. So if you have any suggestions for them, this is how you send it. Yeah, that's how you know that Gauntlet Press has been around for a long time because they have an AOL email address. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Did you have an AOL address? Uh, I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. Did you used to go on ICQ or IRC? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did ICQ and AOL Instant Messenger and stuff. You even had like a, a bulletin board service, right? BBS. Yeah. yeah, well, I, I, a friend of mine ran it off of an Apple Two GS. Gosh. Nerds. <laughs> okay, so uh what's next? All right. So our Kickstarter update. Actually we've got a pretty big update now. Um everything that we could ship has been shipped and you either have it or it's in the mail right now. So any anybody that, that backed us on Kickstarter and bought something that was, you know, a poster or a book that was donated by Clive Barker, um or a Magic of Cards, all, all of that stuff has been shipped out now, and you've either gotten tracking or it's on its way. And um, the only thing left is we're still working on the the iPhone app, which that one's out of our hands. You know, the the developers are working on it, and they actually they actually contacted me the other day, and they're like, "Hey, why do you have two factor authentication on your iTunes account?" I'm like, "Or on your iCloud account?" I'm like, "Well, for security." And they said, "Well, now we can't." Right. Now we can't work on your app. I'm like, oh, okay, fine. I'll turn it off, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's their system. I mean, yeah. they, you know, that's it's a security feature. Right. Uh, yes, I sent uh, I sent myself um, seven tubes with the Do Not Trust the Smiling World poster. Uh, one for you, one for Elena DeGarmo, one yeah. for uh, Phil Warren in England. West Cliff on Sea, another one for Eric Gross, who we've uh, we've 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 talked to him uh, before. 
uh, all these people who bought uh, posters. So I have all these like tracking numbers up, but I think at this point they all must have gotten it already because you already got yours. Yeah, I got mine, and thank you. And and I got the pro the program for um for the history of the devil play in oh that's great in Arizona. yeah that was cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a couple of those, so I sent you an extra one. Um, I, I like that. It was uh, trust the smiling world poster. That's a neat idea. It's. I think it's amazing, and I would like to tell people that um, in the near future we should probably think about offering more of these for sale. Yeah. Because we had a, a limited number of them, and we only sold like seven, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So there are lots more, you know, available. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's a good idea. I think we. We might want to set up some kind of a... A shop in our blog. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that would be good. Also, I really love my t-shirt. I know I'm biased, but hey, I love it. I'm wearing it right now. Oh, that's great. I love it. I like it too. I think it's awesome. Um, And we we definitely didn't make money on those, I think, just because of the limited number of people that, that ordered them. But, uh, yeah, yeah, we could, you know, we could, we could set that up as well. Mm Mm-hmm. For sure, yeah. We have a great design uh, that was inspired by an idea by Rob, and then you, me, and Rob kind of worked on the design a little bit, and I ended up making it on uh, Coral Coral uh, Paint Shop Pro, and I went through some tutorials, and I kind of learned how to make that fake woodcut um, effect over all of it, and uh, I was kind of scared to see how that would turn out with the silk printing. But it came out really, really nice. Yeah. And it um, sounds like you're drumming. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I was kind of drumming on my desk. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So the t-shirt's also available. Um, we'll probably work on making that available throughout the year. We'll we'll let you guys know as we uh, implement that on our blog. The other thing is, I spent another good three hours, um, and I I made a picture on Occupy Midian, you know, Facebook group. If you, anybody wanted to see it, but. I spent a good three hours transcribing um, the Mad Monster Party interviews, which mm-hmm. was really hard because I had those microphones. Uh, accidentally, I had them so the microphone was recording me really well, but you couldn't hear the people I was interviewing very well at all. So I had yeah. a lot of backtracking and trying to guess what people were saying. And after a while, I stopped listening on my phone and went to the original WAV files and ran them through a stereo so that I'd have really good separation between the two channels. And But uh-huh. but I ended up getting the, the uh, interview with Ann Bobby and Craig Sheffer, the one where they first said Occupy Media. And I got that one all typed up. And I, I even got it off the Amiga and into our, uh, into our OneNote, if you want to read through that one. And I did the... Um, not one, uh, not one note. I mean, the, onto drop, Dropbox, and okay, and I did the one with Mark Miller and Russell Charrington also. You know, talking about the Cabal cut uh, before the screening. So it was all kind of the anticipation and the and the hype and me asking you know questions that we all know the answers to now. But back then, it was such a big mystery. That's perfect. I need a I need to step up on uh, on on finishing a few of these episode transcriptions as well, and I want to remind everyone that we do we're going to have like an exclusive Clyde Barker artwork cover on our book, yeah, featuring the father of Lou, the demon. Yeah, uh, and I, I've been kind of thinking about that. I'd I'd like the um, I'd like to maybe do a second run that we sell on the store. So maybe the first edition goes to the Kickstarter backers, and the second you know, edition would be for sale on the store. Sure. Yeah. That's, uh, that sounds good because, um, we, you know, it's not going to take away any value from the Kickstarter book because yeah. this will be defined as a second printing. So, yeah, I think like limited 50 or something for the first run. And then after that, I don't know. It's very, very exciting to think about making an interview book, uh, from our, from our interviews, because it, it, it's something physical that you're going to have to, that you can hold and, and, and read through. And it, I, I think we're going to do a good job with it. And it's going to be a, a lovely book to own and uh, from a fan to, to be able to, yeah. From a fan perspective, just the idea of take, having a book that we wrote or that we made, you know, and putting it on the shelf with my Clive Barker books is going to be like just, just crazy. I, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, you can make your own limited edition book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. So that's that's something to look forward to, and I promise you guys we'll we'll be kept abreast of any developments with the book, 
And we already have kind of a dumber, dummy cover design, but we're still going to work on that a little bit more because yeah. we want it to be like as, as good as we can make it. Yeah, and we'll, there will be a lot of playing with the formatting and, and a lot of probably uh, preamble in, introductions to each interview and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can even get some questions answered by Clyde Barker to put it in the introduction. So yeah. let's see what comes out of that. No guarantees, but let's see what comes up. And that brings us to the Duels of Blood. So round two is over, and uh, go over to www.duelsofblood.com. Round two is over, and round three will have started by the time this episode uh, airs. Yes. So, so, go ahead. So round two had 417 votes so far, uh, which is a not, not a bad result at all. Yeah. Yeah, I think that um, it's a little lower than last year, and I think maybe because we don't have entire brackets dedicated to Clive Barker movies like we did last time. Um, yeah, and also uh, Clive shared our Duels of Blood Volume 1. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, that, that helped a lot. And, and I think as we get towards the end and there's only, like, a few people to vote for, the number of votes just increases exponentially. At least that's what yeah. happened last year. It went into the thousands. Towards mm -hmm. the end, like for, so, uh, into the thousands for each for each uh, vote. I remember, I remember making the, the the total tally at one round in last year, and I think it came up to a total of five thousand votes for yeah. one of those rounds. And I was like very surprised at that. I was like, wow, that's that's really amazing. So, this round two, here are the winners. So, in, in the Abrad bracket, we had. Diamanda versus Malingo. And so um, I'm surprised that Malingo took 66% of the votes. Yeah, well, and Malingo's kind of become a, a, an important sidekick all through Aberat 2 and 3. And I, yeah. I think part of Aberat 1 also. So he, I and, voted for Diamanda, yeah. to be honest. She's <laughs> a little bit more of a cryptic kind of a character. We learn a little more about her, I think, in Aberat 2. But yeah, yeah, I like both of them. Um, I I think I alternated my votes between them. No, oh, I see. Yeah. So the next next match was between Mendelssohn Shape and Dodo, and I think this was clear yeah. that Mendelssohn Shape was going to take it with eighty nine percent of the votes. Yeah, he Mendelssohn Shape is is a, a cool character with a, a large part in the story, and Dodo is really a, an obscure sort of a character, and. Uh, yeah. He's kind of a fish, fish man or fish yeah. creature. A after that, we've got Princess Breath versus Finnegan Hob, uh, and Princess Breath won, which is she's kind of more of a legendary character and not so much of a, not so much, not not one of the, um, not one of the main characters that Candy interacts with like Finnegan. So I was a little surprised to see her, her go, but uh, she's she, it's a more famous painting for sure. Yeah, definitely. I think that the, what, some of the reasons, like you said, was that she's a she's a very well known painting, um, a very striking painting. Yeah. But she never really appears in the in the in the book. By you know, she's mentioned as living in the island of the nuns. I think, yeah. which is three in the afternoon. I think. And and Finnegan Hobb, I guess, just couldn't you know just couldn't live up to princess breath so he lost with 43 percent of the vote but uh i'm sure he's going to be a very important character in the story yeah after that we've got candy quakenbush versus rojo pixler so candy i mean candy beat him by a huge huge margin with 83 percent of the votes not really surprising at all she's the she's the main protagonist for the for the the series so that's right, and I think she's going to beat him in the in the book series as well at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rojo is, is uh, not a nice guy. He's the head of the Comexo Corporation. Right, right. So, it, 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 in some ways, Rojo Pixler and the Comexo Corporation. It's like the Aberat Archipelago is kind of like this magic place, like this Wonderland, but they're not entirely a fantasy kingdom because they have. The Comexo Corporation. So there's a corporation in a fantasy world. Yeah. And and I think it's weird because uh, they even have a mascot, which is the Comexo kid and all that. Yeah. But so they make like 
what do they make? They make like uh, goods and and products and like machines and stuff. Yeah, yeah. They're sort of they sort of embody this like you know commercial commercialization and people like people at uh, people that are sort of obsessed with with um, materialism, sort of killing mm-hmm. and the idea of that killing magic is kind of. I think that's been a recurring theme for Clive Barker's. Sure. Like, uh, like Detective or Inspector Hobart and Weave World and um, a bunch of a bunch of characters who do that. Yes, yeah. yes, they are always the the normalizing, uh, neutralizing force of magic, and with the the banality of of everyday life. Yeah. So for the Imagica bracket, uh, Oscar Godolphin versus Epiximendios. Yeah. I guess Oscar Godolphin came out short. Yeah. Uh, he came up a little short. He lost with 44%. Hepeximendios won with 56%, so he moves on to round three. Yeah, one god for everything. Yep. <laughs> Next one god have... to rule them all. Yeah. yeah. Next we have Huzzah Aping versus Quasar. And I actually kind of – I was voting for Huzzah Aping because I, I – she's just a nicer, more sympathetic character. Quasar is a little Me too. all over the place. But she didn't win. Yeah. I mean, Quasar is more well known, uh, easier to remember from the from the book. Yes, she is, and I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, w- I wish that Huzza had been in the round a little more, but it's it's okay. She made it to the second round. She's a very small side character, and uh, she doesn't come to a good ending. But she's mm-hmm. avenged by Gentle. So yeah, yeah, definitely. I guess now it's your turn to yell at me for spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. We've got uh, Chica Joaquin versus Pio Pa, and this went, I think, exactly how we would have imagined, you know, that it was going to. I mean, yeah. Chica Joaquin is a likable character, and but he just he can't compete with, you know, one of the. If you've got the the um, the rule of the the what is that the the plethroquexos's law that there can only be two characters. Um. There's ah oh, I forgot about that. That's the opening of the first chapter that yeah. you're quoting. Um Yeah, and and Pio Pa is one of those two characters that we learn through the whittling down of all of the characters where you think that Jude is supposed to be the love interest. I think he mentions that there's always like a triangle thing going on between yeah. two be, between two lovers um there's someone who gets in between two warring factions there's going to be a peacemaker and and in this case I guess the fans made their decision to to pick Piopa. Yeah, yeah. And then we've got the so Noli- he goes on to the next. Yeah, yeah. And then we've got the Nolianac versus Alice Tierwit. And you know the Nolianax are really cool, interesting, you know, scary characters. And Alice World Tierwit, Destroyers. Yeah, the the army of Hepexamendios. Not surprising. I mean, this is the nature of the game. Sometimes smaller characters get paired up with very strong either monsters or, or gods or whatever from the, the universe of Clyde Barker. In this case, of course, Alice didn't have a chance to, to beat the Nullianac no. because uh, a lot of people love the Nullianac a lot better, and it, it's it's a really fascinating creature. Um, so moving on to the art books, we have Fletcher versus Kassoon. Uh, Evil won. Kassoon won with 60% of the votes, this which... This surprised uh, me, because as I was checking in on this throughout the last couple of weeks, it, Fletcher was in, in the lead most of the time. But, uh, but Kassoon yes. won at the end. Unfortunately, Fletcher is still dead, uh, <laughs> which yeah. makes yeah. him, uh, right. I guess, a little harder to win this one. Um, as for Harry Damore versus Howie Katz, again, another... Unsurprising result. <laughs> Harry Damore won with 93% of the votes yeah. because it's Harry Damore. Yeah, only two, on. two people voted for Howie Katz. Oh, poor Howie. Yeah. Well, I didn't vote for him. I voted for Harry Damore. Yeah. Um, in the match, Tirata versus Raul, um, Raul won. By one vote. By one vote. Yeah. Really narrow margin, but he's just so uh, such a lovable character. I mean, he... He's the monkey that that evolves into being, you know, smarter than a monkey, um, maybe smarter than some men out there, I guess. Yeah. So he's always been a very interesting character because he's very innocent, right? He's very innocent. He's very friendly. He he just doesn't understand why humans are so, like, nasty sometimes. Yeah. Um, 
but then again, they, you know, the Tarata, obviously, they, they lost. So uh, for one vote. And then we've got the Zarapushu versus Buddy Vance. And uh, <laughs> Zarapushu won. I think Buddy Vance actually put up a pretty good fight, but uh, in the end, he fell back into his, his hole. His hole, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was jogging and he fell down the hole and died. Yeah. So Zarapushu, yes, they, they're fascinating because I want to see how they're going to do uh, against some of the other characters. Yeah. Um, so let's see. The little little squids that float around the quiddity, they're like little pieces of like some sort of deity. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're or maybe like... they're small deities on the by themselves. I I can't remember exactly what, what Clive I mean, mentioned about I, the Zara I think it's pur- purposely vague. They're kind of like soul pilots. They guide the, the souls around in the in the uh, metacosm and the quid and quiddity. Yeah. And that brings us to the last bracket, which is one of the, the most interesting uh, for me, which is the Books yeah. of Blood bracket that has the most interesting characters. Chat Chat won against Barbario's Cancer. Yeah, yeah. Chat Chat from Lost Souls. He had 60% of the votes, so not, not like a landslide or anything. But uh, he, he, fought, he, he fought Cancer and he won. He fought cancer and he won. Oh, God. Um, let's see if he gets a few more scars in the upcoming uh, battles. Maybe he'll match up with Harry Damore. That would be something. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So goodbye, Barbarios Cancer. Um, here's looking at you, kid. <laughs> right. Jacqueline S. versus the Sow in from Pig's Blood Blues. Uh, Jacqueline S. won with 80%, 84% of the votes. Jacqueline Ness turned the sow into a bunch of hot dogs. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she could have controlled the sow's, if she was fighting him, she could have controlled the sow's uh, flesh, right? Right, right. Yeah. I, yeah. Although the sow is also uh, um, a cannibal sow. Well, I mean, can't really say cannibal because she's not human, but she's got the soul of a human kid in there. So she's there's a supernatural element to it. But unfortunately, in this one, yes, maybe she Jacqueline could have turned Ness, him back into a kid again. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, that would have been gruesome and bloody. I would love yeah. to see that. Um, so next match, Mahogany from Midnight Meat Train versus Aaron from The Skins of the Fathers. Yeah. And Aaron um, Aaron was ahead at the beginning, but uh, Mahogany beat him. So, yep. yeah, you've got a movie character versus... Uh, it, uh, a character in a in a in a really good short story, but it's not one that people talk about that often. I don't. You don't. Yeah, see I know. The father's getting reprinted in in short story anthology, and I don't really understand why not because I think that's a really good story. Yeah. Uh, it's it's one of my favorite stories in the books of blood, and I just think it 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 almost has echoes of Nightbreed in a way. Oh yeah, yeah, I think so. It's very Lovecraftian in the way that Cl- Clive introduces us to these monsters that there are like the elder gods or, or something, like in the middle of the desert. Yeah, I particularly like the image of them going in a procession through the desert, like you know, dressed in in in, in weird robes and stuff, and then they they just start turning into these monstrous giant creatures. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah, Aaron lost. Too bad. Yeah. And then the final match is the Madonna versus Quaid. Yeah, yeah, and um, maybe Quaid was hurt by the movie because the Madonna won in, in the end. I'm happy with that result um, because Qu- Quaid, I think, wasn't Quaid in in the 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 voting for last year's Duels of Blood. He was, yeah, yeah, he was. Okay, yeah, but even though I really like the the character in the graphic novel Dread. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's an excellent adaptation, much, much better than the movie yeah. adaptation. But I also found the Madonna to be a fascinating character. She's kind of like that counterpoint to the uh, the first American in the, the Midnight Meat Train. So um, let's see who the Madonna gets paired with. Um, that should be interesting. Well, and then so as we go into round three and, and uh, when you start voting, we'll just kind of run through with the matchups here really quick. But we're going to have... Uh, Malingo versus Mendelssohn Shape. Mm-hmm. Uh, Princess Breath versus Candy Quakenbush. Or Quack- oh, that's going to be hard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hapeximendios versus Quasar. Pio Pa versus the Nullianac. Mm-hmm. Kasoon I- versus Harry Damore. Oh, go ahead. 
No, I was just going to say uh, Piopa versus Nulianak. That's going to be two powerhouses, but I, I think Piopa may come out the, the victor. Let's see. I, I think so, too. I mean, the Nulianaks are – they're – they're so alien, and they have no. Um, <clears throat> there's no no emotion, no yeah. remorse. Yeah. Kasun versus Harry Demore is going to be um, quite the match as well. Although I I think that Harry Demore may win, but I let's think, see. Yeah, let let's see. Be uh, similar, I think, to you know, if I we think. get any surprises. And then we've got uh, Raul versus Zarapushu. Mm-hmm. I, I have no idea how that one's gonna, how that one's going to turn out. Yeah, they're kind of like similar in terms of like being well-known characters in the the art trilogy. Yeah, um, Cha Chat versus Jacqueline S. So I'd I'd have to give that to Jacqueline S. because I think Cha Chat he's not in a he's in a story that didn't make it into the the books of blood. Uh, it's been published here and there in a couple of short story volumes, and you can find it on the internet. I'm going to vote for Chat Chat because yeah. I want to see him meet up, match up with Harry Damore <laughs> further oh, yeah. down the line. Yeah, that would be cool. Sometimes that would be like huh. last year we had stuff like that happen, right? We ended up with like Cabal versus Decker, which we totally yeah. didn't plan at all, but it just it wound up that way. Yes. And then we're going to have uh, Mahogany versus the Madonna. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really wow. Interesting. Really, really interesting because, like, I, I was talking about Midnight Meat Train, and here it is: Midnight Meat Train versus the Madonna. Yeah, and um, Mahogany works for the First American, which is sort of a a patriarchal sort of a character, right? Yeah, yeah. I would say that. I, I think that's a good good point. So uh, let's let's see, well, ladies. Here's your chance to make the Madonna win. Yeah. Go vote for the Madonna. <laughs> yeah. Or whoever is your favorite, really. Yeah. But yes. And you could that vote should be in, in, in every five minutes, you know, if you if you have the patience for that. Um, of course, if every round there are fewer uh, fewer votes that you have to do, so you can do more times if you want to. Um, mm-hmm. I'd like to see the I'd like to see the voting go up just so we don't see as many characters winning by like you know three or four votes or one vote. You know, just. To, I'm going to vote for for some of my favorite characters here, and I, I, I usually this this time I have only voted once on each round, so I'll, I'll see I'll see how that uh, evolves. Yeah, because I don't want to affect uh, the results that much. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I I, don't, I usually only do it when I'm curious to see how things are going, and you have to vote if you want to see what the if you want to see the the totals. So I'll do right. Like, I usually do like three or four, you know, over the course of the, the weeks just to just to see where they're at. So we'll start sharing these a little more, see if we can get these out out to, to more people. And and if you'd like, please share those on your feed as well with your friends, uh, especially the ones you know are Clyde Barker fans, because this is kind of a fun. It's a fun thing that we do, and it's the second time we're doing it, and, and it, it puts people in connection with a lot of, like, obscure characters they may may never have heard of before. Yeah. Because, obviously, I know there's a lot of people out there, they've never read all of Clyde Barker's books like we have. But, uh, but you know, that sometimes you, you hear about a character and you're like, oh, well, where is this from? It's like, oh, Chat Chat from Lost Souls. I've never read that story. It could be a gateway into finding, like, stories that will really appeal to you as a Clyde Barker fan. So that's why we do it. Yeah, and and um, I think you know the, our first year was a little easier because we had all these well-known characters. But you know, if, if this works out, and if this is you know, I'd like to. I was thinking maybe comic book characters next time around. Um, yeah, why not? Yeah, if you know, but uh, it, we admit that it's a little bit more for the hardcore Clive Barker fans. But um, you know, that's kind of our wheelhouse. So yes, that's true. That's very true. So there's a little bit of all of Clive Barker's books in here. So that that the variety really helps with with making it more attractive to people who like, for example, like Imagica. There's plenty of Imagica here, or Aberat, which is one of his most popular books. So um, yes, please go ahead and vote and share and and let us know who you want to uh, to be the, the the big winner of yeah. this year's Duels of Blood. www.duelsofblood.com with no spaces or dashes or anything. D U E L S O F B L O O D.com. Duelsofblood.com. 
who are you uh who are you betting on 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 taking the whole thing this year like last year it was uh julia yeah I'm kind of wondering maybe Harry Demore, but then, you know, I kind of was thinking maybe that him or Pinhead because of the Scarlet Gospels last year and that didn't happen. So, you know, honestly, right. our listeners are more hardcore Clive Barker fans. Uh, they voted for Julia and, you know, which is cool. That was a good choice. I think so, too. I think it was uh, very surprising because I always thought it was going to be Pinhead, but then it, it turned out to be Julia. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that the I think the 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 listeners and the Clive Barker fans are going to surprise us, but um, but I think I I would think it'd be like Harry Demore, but I you know what do I know? <laughs> you know I I thought it was going to be Pinhead last year, so so the uh, round two voting ended today, uh, four twenty, hey four twenty, and it, the the round three is going to start when. Like uh, oh, uh, April twenty first, twenty second. Oh, let's see. What? So today's the twentieth. Mm-hmm. Probably, I think Sunday morning. That's typically what we do. So okay, uh, so the twenty third. Yeah, the twenty third at eight o'clock in the morning, Alaska time, which is a little later for everybody else. And then it'll probably end on uh, two weeks from then. Yeah. May seven. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, well, let's see. It would be two weeks from then on the Thursday morning. So, uh, two. So that's May fourth. Okay. May the fourth be with you. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So that's that's an auspicious date for round three, and then there's still three rounds to go after that. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it just gets easier. Voting can get done a lot faster as the more and more characters get eliminated. Um, but it's fun. All right, so that's our news and our uh, Kickstarter update and our Duels of Blood end of round two. Yeah, so now we want to talk again about Clive Barker's A to Z of Horror, uh, the, the, the 1996 book. And we're talking about the, the, the British TV sh- series. And this, mm-hmm. uh, this week, or this episode, we're talking about the letters G, H, and I. So we kind of start out with G is for Grim Tales. I love the illustration that opens up this chapter in the book. Nice. It's got like a, a a wolf man, like holding a, an arm in his mouth, <laughs> yeah. painted by Clive Barker. It's yeah. just such a great illustration. That, that is cool. And um, I think kind of like the uh, the um, Little Red Riding Hood. Yes. Yeah. He's eating like the granny or something. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. And I, I, I thought this was a neat um, – the, this chapter was neat just to kind of point out the, the you know the differences between the original grim fairy tales and and what probably the majority of people know as the you know the Disney stories and stuff yeah that that they're they're pretty dark and grim and there's a lot of like killing children oh yeah yeah there's I, I sometimes mix some stories uh, that I think they're from the Brothers Grimm, but they're not. They can be from Hans Christian Andersen. Oh, yeah. Or, you know, sometimes it, it kind of gets a little fuzzy, uh, which is which. But uh, definitely we grew up with stories like The Little Red Riding Hood where, uh, you know, a, a wolf eats the grandma and then dresses up as a grandma. Or we've, yeah. we've read stories about – uh, the little girl who sells matches in the middle of the snow, and then she's she's striking the matches to stay warm because she's an orphan and she doesn't, you know, they're really really very gruesome stories. Uh, you have the one with Hansel and Gretel where yeah. they they're being fattened by a cannibal witch that's going to eat them. Yeah, I know, yeah, and and you got like um, well, and if you take like the Disney ones like Cinderella originally, that you know the, there's some pretty gruesome stuff in that one too, like the. The stepsisters, when they're trying to fit their feet in the glass slipper so mm-hmm. that they can marry that prince or whatever, that they're, one of them cuts her heel off to try to fit yes. her, her foot in the in the slipper, and the other one cuts her toes off. And so this gruesome. glass slipper has got blood all over it. <laughs> yes. Or, you know, uh, Sleeping Beauty. Um, right. She, sleeping. Was, she wasn't sleeping. She was dead, right? I yeah. Mean, she she's... ate a poisoned apple and died. If only one of the the one of the seven dwarves could do the Heimlich maneuver, that could, that could have saved her. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, there, there's some, you know, there's a lot of damsels in distress kind of thing going on, and there's there's a lot of gruesome stuff like when a demon shows up in a Grimm Brothers tale, uh, 
he's going to do some demonic stuff. So, yeah, but it comes from this idea that kids that you need to protect kids from like sex, but not violence, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, the, the brothers Grimm took really old stories. And from what, from what we understood from this chapter, they, they took really old stories and they, they left the violence the same, but they cut out all of the sex and, you know, toilet humor and things like stuff like that. Yeah. That happens a lot in horror that involves kids. And for example, there's one thing that's been making the rounds, which of course you may have heard that it for this right. the Stephen King story is being uh, remade. So there's yeah. a new movie coming out, but none of the adaptations, none of the two adaptations ever really addresses one scene that happens near the end. If you've read the book yeah. where this, the girl, she has sex with the boys in the sewers to kind of break them out of a trance and so there was like a 12-year-old orgy going on in the sewers in the yeah. book at yeah. one point, and that never made it into the movies. When I read that in that book, I'm, I just felt like what a, I need to – I it was made me really uncomfortable and not in like a good way. It would just kind of felt like I don't feel good reading this right now. <laughs> yes. It's kind of, it goes a little – crosses a line or yeah. something that, that you didn't know you, you had traced. Yeah. It's kind of, I mean, it, this is not to say anything bad about Stephen King, but, you know, it's kind of like when I read about Victor Salva, I, mm -hmm. I put my copy of, of Jeepers Creepers in a pile of stuff that I'm going to sell at a garage sale. You know, I don't. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's like. It kind of, so you didn't like Jeepers Creepers I, I or did, you just didn't I, like I, the I author? Did, I did like Jeepers Creepers and now I feel bad about it after having read, you know, the inspiration that he has to, to make the movie that way. Uh huh. That yeah, he, it was definitely a weird a convicted, movie. Convicted, uh, convicted pedophile. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't know about that. I think I might have heard something, but now that you're mentioning, yeah, I but think he, I remember hearing something. But for some reason, he just kind of gets a pass in the movie industry, and I don't know. I mean, there's stories on the movie sets of you know stuff that happened, and he sort of glorifies it in his movies. It's what people yeah, that, say, you know. There's stories like that for a lot of directors, like. Uh, um, Brian Singer um, and really? the other guy who did uh, Dress to Kill. I forgot his name. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're, yeah, Brian Singer. Yeah, Google it up. Brian Singer and, and, and boys. I'm not saying it, it's true. I'm saying there was rumors and there was like, you know, uh, articles written about it. So, you know, it's yeah. whatever. Anyway, yeah. so one of the stories that opens up this chapter is called The Juniper Tree. And yeah. I have... Yeah, it's a very creepy – it just perfect, perfectly defines this idea that there's really scary children's stories out there. Yeah, and they, they kind of – they give you the entire story of the juniper tree in this cap in this chapter and in the TV series also uh, mm -hmm. so, so that you can – you know, and, and it's probably one of the most gruesome examples that they could come up with of a, of a, of a Grimm's fairy tale to say like, hey, these – you know – this is what these stories are like, and and it's a it's God man, it, it's a it's a yeah. There's like a couple, and the guy the the, the man has a, a son, and he's he's a he remarries, and then he has a daughter with his new wife, and then the the new wife always looks at the the stepson as kind of standing in the way of her daughter, you know, inheriting and in, inheriting stuff or, you know, because it's always going to be like the, the, the firstborn, the boy, yeah. he's going to be the little prince. Okay. So she decides that she needs to kill him. And, and what, what one I, day she, yeah. and what I, what I thought was really weird is like, she lures him over to this apple bin, right? And he's like, why don't you get some apples? Mm -hmm. I thought, uh Oh, she poisoned the apples and no, she slams the bin on his head and decapitates him. That's pretty gruesome. Yeah. yeah I thought the same thing. Him. Yeah. When I was reading it. And uh, it's it's really gruesome. So there you go. You know, you have all these things that happen. Um, I mean, I've heard several stories. For example, Red Riding Hood. I don't know which version you've you've heard, but the version I've heard is that he eats the grandmother, and then he eats Little Red Riding Hood, and then there's like a woodsman that comes with his axe and slices the wolf's belly, and they both come out alive oh, from the. Okay. And, yeah. There's variations on that. Some of them, I don't think he actually eats Red Riding Hood, or he just eats the grandma. Right. 
Yeah. But I guess that then there's like different versions of uh, of those stories. Yeah, yeah. I remember we had talked a little bit about that with Paul Kane when with when we had him on to talk about his book Red. Yeah. But so the juniper tree, uh, after the stepmom decapitates the boy, she says, "Well, now I need to make the body disappear." And so what does she does? She does uh, she, black pudding. Yeah. Oh my God. She turns and then she and feeds she, it. To, she feeds it to his father. Yeah, He's like man, it's... this is so good. I need more, and he keeps eating more and more, and throwing the bones under the table. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, Scott Tennerman must die in South Park when Cartman kills a boy's parents and turns them into chili. Oh, yeah, I don't. Have you ever seen that? No, <laughs> I mean I've seen South Park a couple of times, but oh, okay, gotcha. I'm a big fan of South Park. That's I... another thing for like last episode that I forgot to mention. I'm a big oh. fan of South Park. Well, and I've seen it. It's the stuff that's only on cable. I usually only ever see if I'm like in a hotel somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I also got Netflix recently. So, wow, I'm just binging on stuff right now. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so Tim Burton appears in this chapter and he also appears in the, the TV um, uh, episode. And he's just talking about these these fairy tales that he listened to when he was when he was younger yeah. and uh, at first when i saw him on the tv series i'm like who is that guy because i i think i had missed it when they put his name you know under the on the little title underneath him oh really i was like yeah. geez what is this guy he's wearing sunglasses indoors who does he think he is and then you know and then later it's like oh that's tim burton okay So they have an interview with a lady called Hannah Castillan, a reader in the modern languages at London University, and she talks about the Grimm brothers. She mentions that you know they're pretty prudish about the sexual aspects of the stories and about body functions, <clears throat> and they almost eliminated them entirely. However, they were less prudish about the violent aspects. Yeah. They felt that children could take these. Children were not easily frightened. They would not be damaged by this violence at all. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I guess. I mean, kids can be cruel. Yeah. If there's one thing that kids know is how to be cruel and how to be violent sometimes. Um, yeah. Because I guess we're still kind of maturing our emotional um, baggage, I guess. Yeah. But kids can be really, really cruel. And, you know, you think about uh, Lord of the Flies, for example. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever read the book or seen the movie? Both, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's another one that kind of – plays into the the i letter yes. that we're going to talk later yeah yeah uh, and and next yeah, the was, innocence next was h for h for harlequinade which i at first i thought it was just h for harlequin uh but uh it's about basically about clowns and scary clowns and this chapter is not in the tv series anywhere there is no h h isn't for anything in the tv series they either never filmed it or didn't did never aired it yeah, that was weird. I was asking about I was asking about this uh, earlier before we started the podcast. I was like, yeah. did they ever mention the age? Yeah. So uh, it, it opens up with some really good shots of Lon Chaney playing a clown. I think this one is um, the man who laughs, yeah, uh, and he who gets slapped. In both those movies, Lon Chaney Senior um, plays a clown. And I love these two movies. I've always enjoyed these two movies, even before I read this book, because I like Lon Chaney Sr. And I like clowns. I'm not afraid of clowns. There's a lot of people out there who are afraid of clowns. <laughs> I but guess I guess you, it's – Yeah, whenever you hear clowns talked about, people don't ever talk about like what you just did. People don't almost never say like, oh, I think clowns are great. It's almost yeah, always well, like I'm afraid of clowns. If anybody ever says anything I have a about good them, experience oh. with clowns. Yeah, I have a good experience with clowns. Clowns means going to the circus with yeah. your parents. Clowns means laughing and having fun. But on the other hand, <clears throat> as an adult and having experienced a lot of different things growing up, I can see why some people can be afraid of clowns. Because another thing this uh, this chapter talks about is that a clown, he's kind of like. Um, you know, he, he, he's a human being that doesn't act, think, or look like a human being. Yeah. So in some ways, he kind of breaks the rules, and you don't know what to expect from a clown. And they say the clown. reason he's funny is because you're laughing out of sort of a nervous, like, I don't understand this kind of a thing. It's not like, right. oh, that's hilarious. It's more like, 
these people aren't acting like humans, and I don't know how to react, so I'm going to laugh. Yeah, it's like when you see something surreal and you laugh because your brain doesn't know how to react, and it's just like, okay, well, I'm just going to dismiss it with a laugh. Yeah. Yeah, because their their painted faces look weird, and their you know their their clothes aren't right, and, and it's not yeah. like, it's not like you're oh they're dressing like a nerd. It's like no nobody dresses like that. I remember watching as a teenager the movie Killer Clowns from Outer Space. I, I don't know if you ever saw that. I, I actually saw that two days ago because you had talked about it on a previous episode and said I should watch uh-huh. it. So I I went and saw it. And that is a crazy movie, and it's the isn't it crazy? It's got a, a theme song about killer clowns that they play twice in in the in the movie. And it's killer just like the clowns. scenes where the clowns are interacting with people. They're just like such awkward, weird scenes. That the whole like mood of the scene is weird. You don't know whether yeah. to laugh or yeah. And again, you smile because it's like this is weird. And then it turns yeah. them into cotton candy. And, oh, God, that is so weird. Like, aliens that look like clowns. Yeah, and I thought at some point in the movie that they would explain why they they not only... I mean, I could I could see that they might look like clowns. I You know, I'd be willing to let that go. But the fact that everything they do is some kind of a clown... Like, every kill that they do is, like, some kind of clown-related thing. That's uh-huh. a little much for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird film. It's it a weird really film. Weird. And the only but, explanation they ever gave is they said, "Oh, well, maybe clowns are they've been here before and maybe clowns are based on them." Yeah. Yeah, that's But that was just somebody's, you know, guess. Well, it could have contrived, but uh yeah. but you know, it's not unusual for someone to come up with an idea like that, like in Stargate. Oh, yeah, I, people I drew Egyptian gods based yeah, on Yeah, people these drew aliens. Egyptian gods with with animal heads because that's that's the aliens armor that they came to earth with so yeah 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 hey and you start reading about killer clowns and, and stuff like John Wayne Gacy was a clown yeah right yeah and he was yeah. a mass murderer he he was how many they found was it like 15 bodies or something in his floorboards i, I don't even know i don't want to think about that too much but uh, the fear of clowns is called cholerophobia, oh. and actually, a lot of people suffer from it, which is, is very yeah. surprising. And and, and and that, but uh, like, that, that, but we have to. You, 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 I think we have to say that there's a difference between saying I don't like clowns and clowns are creepy, which is what most people say, versus like I have an actual like debilitating fear of clowns. <laughs> right, right. It's kind of like everybody says, "Oh, I have OCD," or you know, like. My OCD makes me put my CDs in alphabetical order or I can't stand seeing this thing uneven or whatever. That's different from people who have actual obsessive compulsive disorder and can't leave the house without, you know, checking the oven seven times or whatever. Like yeah. Quaid in Dread, he's actually afraid of clowns. Yeah, and actually that was something I wanted to talk about here because Dread didn't really get mentioned in this chapter because Clive Barker's talking about other things. He's not talking about his own work, but... Dread is a really scary clown story, and I think that got lost in the movie. Yeah, I agree. I agree, because they, they forgot the part where uh, um, the guy that, that Quaid uh, sends over the edge, he kind of regresses into infancy, so he kind of starts acting like a, like a like like an adult child, which kind of makes him more like a clown. And then when he goes to, like, the shelter, and he puts on, like, you know... Um, clothes from a uh, bin for the homeless people and he puts on mismatching socks and he puts on these striped uh, out you know shirts and stuff and he kind of looks and makes himself look like a clown unwittingly yeah. and then he just gets back to quade's apartment holding a fire axe and and he had and like he's, blood on his face that looked like clown makeup yeah because he's biting his lip because he's so yeah. like he's in like this kind of fugue state and he's yeah. biting his lips. So there's blood on his mouth makes like the mouth look much more red. And Quaid so, had, and Quaid had a real debilitating fear of clowns that was not explained. It's just something that he had. Yeah. Yeah. So another movie that they talk in this chapter, uh, for, uh, Harlequinade is funny man from 1994. And I saw the trailer for this movie and I'm not sure if I've seen it, Ever. It looks very familiar yeah, to me. I, yeah, I you put the trailer in our show notes, so I was watching that too. I'm like, what? where was I in 1994 that I'd never even heard of this movie? 
Yeah, that happens sometimes when I'm going through old Fangoria's and I find these movies that look really amazing, but it's like I never heard of it. So this is another one. It's got Christopher Lee in there as well. It probably uh, had a super limited theatrical run, right? Like a weekend or maybe a weekend until the next movie came out the next weekend. and Maybe. It, you know, and then, you know, if they don't make a big deal about the video release. So this... this uh Funny man uh, is he's a demon clown. He's a demon clown played by Tim James and, and he, the makeup's he looks like the Joker on a deck of cards. Yes, he do, he does. He's got that Joker hat with three three pointed hat with yeah. bells on the tips. And uh, the makeup is made by Neil Gordon, who also did a lot of makeup for Doctor Who, like uh, the Santoran or oh. the Cybermen. And he's made a lot of like uh, work in the industry. So that, it's a very interesting makeup design and i want to watch this movie now i think i'm going to try to find it on netflix and uh, put it on my queue and the, the plot is that there's this christopher lee character that that gets into a, a a card game with all these other people and deliberately loses and he loses his house but what he's really doing is like oh well now he, and then as soon as these people go to the house to to explore it because they want it then then that's where this demon joker is yeah yeah they're they're doing um that's right the funny man yeah he's got an evil sense of humor yeah and it's weird do you think i mean neither one of us have seen this movie do you think that christopher lee's character is some kind of devil you know that they made a bargain with or i guess we'll Mm, see i think yeah i think his name is colin um, it's just a brief cameo, and I think he's the guy who loses the home in a poker game. But the, but I think they said in the blurb that he lost it on purpose. Oh, well, I guess we'll find out when we watch the movie. Yeah, yeah, that, that'll that be interesting. I wonder if that can be found on, like, Netflix or Amazon Prime. Another person talking in this uh, chapter is a guy from Our Chaos, which is kind of an anar- anarchic um, circus. Hmm. And so this guy, Kovach, Jason Kovach, he's talking about clowns, and then he's the one who talks about, you know, natural response to horror is kind of like laughter um, initially. And and I was looking up our chaos, and I think I've heard of them before. And what they do seems to me uh, similar to what another theater troupe from Spain did called La Fura del Baus. Mm -hmm. And they're just like these performance artists that do this – Imagine like an experimental theater slash Cirque du Soleil where people do like weird things and there's like special effects and there's like people hanging from like ropes and stuff. And it's it's they they call themselves clowns, but they don't really look like the, the, the typical kind of clown. It's more like this experimental theater kind of thing. So I'm uh, fascinated with that. And uh, I definitely want to see more about a, our chaos. Well, and Clive Barker was even fascinated with clowns. I mean, he, his uh, his dog company theater was – they did um, mime. And yeah, well, using the characters from Commedia dell'arte, which is like the Harlequin, uh, uh, yeah. uh, Dulcinea or whatever. Yeah, and there's um, like Crazy he, Face. I think the, in this chapter yeah. there's even a little excerpt from Crazy Face. Yeah, the like characters who wear like these domino suits and – you know, they, they paint their face white and do mime. Yeah. So that's that's a, a big reference for a lot of people who did theater back in the 60s, 70s, and I think even 80s, right? It's, it's kind of like a for, formative theater thing to go through yeah. to do mime or pantomime, uh, even nowadays, I guess. But so, for example, for clowns, I always heard that there's two kinds of clowns. And I don't know if you guys know this as well, but... Uh, there's like we used to call it the poor clown and the rich clown, and the poor clown is the guy who has like the big painted mouth and he's wearing like a tiny little top hat, oh, and he's yeah, got yeah. the eyes painted uh, really big, and he's got the red nose. And then the rich clown is usually like his face is white. He's got like an arched eyebrow. He's got like uh, a domino suit like made of satin, usually white. Huh. He's more like black and white. He doesn't really have red or he doesn't have the red nose. And usually in the circus that I used to go to, he always plays like an instrument, like a saxophone or a trumpet or a clarinet. And he, he speaks normally like a normal person, whereas the poor clown, he's the guy who has to make the funny voice and he trips over and he falls and he gets back on his feet. Huh. So. 
there, to me, in my European circus experience, I always had, whenever you see the clowns, there's always going to be two or three poor clowns and then one rich clown who's usually telling them, hey, you guys got to do this. You guys got to do part of the act. And, and then they do it, but they do it wrong. Or, they, or you know, right, or they're because, making fun of the rich clown. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, that's interesting. And, and I, I, I've seen that act before, and I know what you mean, but I never thought of them as the rich clown and the poor clown before, but that makes sense. That's what we used to call them in Portugal. I don't know if that translates into other cultures or if, you know, but I guess we'll find out. That just made me have this flashback when I was in kindergarten. I had a, uh, a babysitter that we would go to her house after, before and after school, and uh, she had all these paintings of sad, I guess they'd be poor clowns because they had the little hat. And they were making yeah. like a, a sad face. There were all these yeah. paintings all over her house of those. And I thought this, you know, I mean, I was just in kindergarten, but I remember thinking, man, this is, you know, this is kind of creepy and weird. Yeah, I guess it is. And if you let your house get dominated by artwork of clowns, I guess it, it does get a little creepy after yeah. a while. Um, that That's the tragic comic side of the clown, right? It's like you have to perform whether you're happy or not. Yeah. That's that's always the thing with the clowns. Like, um, but but yeah, I. What else can we talk about clowns? I guess that's it for the clown yeah, thing. I think so, and then I is for innocence. Like, oh yeah, I just want to talk a little bit. Mm-hmm. I, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the Lon Chaney movies that he played clowns in. Oh yeah, like Laugh Clown Laugh and He Who Gets Slapped. Um. In He Who Gets Slapped, and this is kind of like one of my favorite ones, he's he starts out as like a professor or an assistant of, to a professor in a university, and then he comes up with some enormous breakthrough. And then when he's about to 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 lecture about it with his uh, mentor, the mentor takes credit for his work in front of everybody when they're showing what, what they discovered. And then when he tries to say, wait, no, I actually discovered it with you. The the professor kind of s- slaps him gently in the face and and just kind of dismisses him and everybody laughs. And this like this sequence is so weird because when the guy gets slapped on stage by his mentor and everybody laughs, he just kind of gets into this like giant like, you know, meltdown moment where he's like, oh, no, I can't believe how humiliating. And he just kind of snaps. And the next you see of him, he's playing a clown in a circus. He like he gave up science. He gave up being like in in in, in the university, and he went in and became a clown whose sole act is to get slapped by dozens of other clowns, and everybody oh. laughs. And every and they go over to him and they slap him, and everybody laughs. And then another guy comes and slaps him, and everybody laughs. And they really slap him. Wow. So he kind of relives that moment over and over, you know. And sometimes he looks at the audience and he kind of sees like the the jury and the members of the academy oh. just laughing at him. It's so weird. It's a really weird movie, but it's it's such a, a such a tragic story. And um, he falls in love with a girl, and yeah, he falls in love with a girl and stuff. It's I don't want to spoil it, but it's a really fascinating film. Huh. He who gets slapped. I'll have to see if I can find it. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. Well, uh, then we've got I for innocence, uh, and. This is about basically about movies where children are the bad guys, you know, children of the corn. Uh, the big one that they talk a lot about is uh, the Bad Seed from 1956. Um, the, so you tried watching that, right? Yeah, I well, I put it on my queue to watch, and then I thought, you know, and and I watched the trailer, and you know how trailers for these old movies are like ten, fifteen minutes long. So uh-huh. I, I watched the trailer and it's kind of like, yeah, I think I've seen everything I need to see about <laughs> this movie. It's a beautiful blonde girl with pigtails, uh, except that she's totally a sociopath. Right. Like she kills this guy with his shoes or something, from what I understood from the trailer. Some, yeah, somehow she drowns a kid and then the gardener figures it out and, and she she does something where she burns the gardener alive. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so it starts out with Ray Bradbury's uh, the 1947 short story called The Small Assassin. Mm. Um, I think I remember this story. There's 
there's one and I've seen stories like this, especially in like old pulp uh comic books like uh those Warren comics. I, I remember there was one story that I thought this story is really weird and uh, probably wouldn't fly today. But it's about this little kid whose mom remarries a black man and then he starts having these nightmares every night that the black man is a cannibal and he's going to come and kill him. Mm. And he keeps getting these vivid nightmares until one night he just grabs a knife and he kills the his black stepdad uh, in the bed. Jeez. And yeah, he's like a little toddler. And just weird things like that that they would come up with in the 60s and 70s, these stories about kids being being horrible murders. I was thinking of um, Damien in The Omen, for example. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's or, one that I've seen a lot of times. Yeah, or Anthony Fremont playing uh, Bill Mummy. Oh, no, I'm sorry, the other way around. Bill Mummy playing Anthony Fremont, the kid in It's a Good Life, the Twilight Zone episode. Oh right, where, yeah, where he can, everybody has to have good thoughts, right? Or because he can uh, he can read their minds and he can do it. He can make anything yeah. happen. It's a good thing that you did that. It's a good thing, Billy. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> or to, he, uh, that, yeah. that I think the Matrix kind of stole a little from that, right? Because Disney he Disney make his sister shut up by making her mouth disappear. I think I remember something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then they did that. And, in, there's, and then the agents did that to Neo in in uh, in the Matrix. Right. If you're or able um, to speak. Yes, Mr. Anderson. Yeah. Uh, also, I remember the Karen, the girl in the Night of the Living Dead, the girl that turns into a zombie. Yes. Right. And she kind of she murders her own father with like a trowel. Yeah. Or whatever. Or it's the mom. I forgot. And they also. Uh, mentioned- yeah, and the mom. They also mentioned Carrie in here, which I think is a little bit of a stretch. I mean, I, I mean, she's based, she's a teenager, and I think you know she's just somebody that got pushed too far. Sure, I agree. Yeah, she's not. I she's think not so. Like but, but an inherently evil thing that you don't understand, like you know a lot of these other other kid characters. I think they include her because she represents kind of an innocence. Like she's a virgin. She's she's repressed. She's supposed to be this this uh, you know. Homely looking girl, but then she kind of snaps and and murders a bunch of people. Yeah. So, yeah, but um, I remember, you know, there was a, I think it was a philosopher called Henry David Thoreau. I think he was the guy who came up with that theory of like the the good savage, that men is inherently good, which of course we know nowadays that that's not really, you know, that's not really true. I mean, that's not necessarily true. If you leave someone to their own devices, they're not necessarily going to be nice people, especially if you let a kid, you know, raise itself. Yeah. Uh, there's it depends. It's a matter of nurture. You know, it's 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 that's that's what you instill the principles. But I remember the case of this kid. Um, he was supposed to be a wild kid, uh, Victor of Averyron. And I got a. A Wikipedia link here. He's supposed to be this savage child that became quite a sensation in France because they discovered him in the woods and he didn't really speak and his body was full of scars and he just people thought that he had been living in the woods for years. And then they tried teaching him how to speak and how to read and stuff, but he was kind of mentally impaired in some ways. Uh and then nowadays the 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 consensus is that he wasn't really like raised by wolves or anything like that. He might have been just kind of a, an autistic kid that was abused by some family who let him run around the forest. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, you hear stuff like that. I mean, I remember not too long ago, I've I've read a story that here in America, there were some trailer people who were keeping one of their kids in like a, a dog crate in their trailer. Oh, jeez. And the, the kid didn't even speak, and it was already like a few years old. And it was like, the, yeah, it's 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 kind of a horrible thing to do to a child. Yeah. But it, again, I yeah, like innocence has innocence is kind of debatable because there's there's kids who can be really really mean. Yeah. Uh, well, and I think in this in this chapter they also talked about it was based on a fear that. Children are like these feral creatures running around that, you know, and we have to keep them in line and keep them under control. Right, right. So The Bad Seed was a story of Rhoda Penmark, an 80-year-old child murderess played by 11-year-old Patty McCormick, who starred in the play and received an Academy Award nomination for a portrayal in the film. And the actress actually um, 
is in the TV episode, and she's being interviewed, and you can see it's, she's the same actress that played the movie. Yeah, it's cool. And she she talked about the way she approached the 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 play and the movie is that she didn't she didn't think of her as a bad person. She thought of her like this is what she does in this situation, and this is what she does in this situation, and it's kind of like in her mind everything she does is justified. You know, well, he took away my shoes, so I drowned him or whatever. Or, you know, he was going to tell on me for because he, he caught me killing that kid, so I set him on fire. You know, it's like, you know. Yeah, exactly. She has no sense of, of not being good or not being bad. She just takes care of business. Yeah. That's what they say here in the book. Yeah, yeah. I totally, you know, whether it's out of proportion to, you know, to what happened or whatever, she does, doesn't really cross her mind. Yeah, and another one that they talk about in this episode, in this episode, in this chapter, is the Children of the Damned. Um, yeah, that was that movie that was remade by uh, 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 had Carpenter. Christ- had Christopher Reeve in it, right? Yeah, and that's the one that I saw was that remake. I don't know if the I don't think I've seen the original one. But yeah, that's right. From Carpenter, right? John Carpenter, I think. Well, and I, one thing that we've I, I totally forgot about until right now is we got Clive Barker's The Plague. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, that's kind of a... It, it's a it's a terrible, boring movie, and it's not... Clive Barker didn't make it, you know, but... Uh, yeah, we, we've that's also We've talked about worthy. that a lot of times, but but it's, you know, that's that's that would fit into this category. Maybe that's why Clive Barker kind of gravitated toward the project, because he saw, like... The, the echo of this sort of thing that he kind of resonated with because um, yeah. he, you know, made a chapter about all this stuff about kids and stuff. So, and obviously Clyde Barker doesn't have any kids. So, yeah. Yep. He's got a nephew. All right. And, yeah. I mean, I, this is not, this is not a, a genre of a sub genre of horror that I really care that much about. I mean, I kind of liked, I like some of these seventies movies like Rosemary's Baby and The Omen and stuff, but I you know, when you if you center a movie around kids, then a lot of the time it's bad acting or you know, stuff that's not very plausible or I don't know. This is not I guess this is not for me. Yeah, I mean you have a kid, uh which is an experience that I obviously do not have. So uh is there anything that you want to share like in terms of does it does it make you feel more distressed watching a movie where a kid is going through something horrible because you have a kid of your own uh well not if they're not if they're a really bad kid i mean i i think that i guess you feel sorry for the parents if they, you know if it's a really bad kid cuz like what do you do you can't you're not going to kill your your kid and but then if it's a um, if it's a movie where something terrible happens to like an innocent kid, like, um, you know, watching, um, what was that, that movie that Rob just sent me over, um, that I, yeah, watching Pumpkinhead again is like, mm. that, that, you know, the, for me, the whole horror of that is the first like 15 minutes of that movie and the rest of it, you know, sure. I, don't, I don't really care that much if those teenagers get killed by Pumpkinhead or not, but you know, watching that poor kid get run over, it's, you know. And and oh, yeah, Erickson yeah. leaving him alone, you know, in in the store for for hours while he goes and makes a delivery to somebody. Right, and I mean nowadays you hear all these stories about people who leave their kids in the car, and then someone breaks the window to rescue the kid. And especially here in Arizona, there's a lot of that going around. Yeah, usually it's dogs, but sometimes it's kids. And then it's like, oh, the kid had to go to the hospital because he was like. And and in that case, I mean, obviously the kid's not at fault, but I'm just saying that uh, yeah. kids can be neglected. And sometimes if you're too neglected, they can just, you know, become terrible people. Yeah. Uh, another movie I think really fits with the chapter that we just talked about is, you remember Macaulay Culkin, The Good Son? The, uh, it's a movie that he did with uh, Elijah Wood. It sounds familiar, but I don't think I've seen it. I mean, Yeah, I it I've takes just, place I've in Arizona. Seen. Yeah, it takes place in Arizona. It's like uh, Elijah Wood is 11 years old, and his mom passed away, and then uh, he's his father's going on a business trip to Tokyo, I think, and then and then he leaves him in this house with one of his friends, and his friend Macaulay Culkin, he's you know 
he's just a psycho kid. He just oh, wow. he, he has there's a scene where he takes him to you know when like in The Simpsons, Bart and Milhouse go to the overpass and spit on moving cars. Yeah. In this case, uh, Macaulay Culkin takes Elijah Wood to an overpass and he shows him like a scarecrow that he made, and then he, he knocks a scarecrow off the overpass on top of a car. And then oh. there's a big car pileup accident. Oh, so this is just a weird, weird kind of kid that he is, Macaulay wow. Culkin. And then at the end, he actually tries to kill Elijah Wood or something. Oh, um, yeah, I've seen it years ago. It's from uh, 1993, I think. Wow. So it's called The Good Son. So, yeah, if you want to see a movie with a really creepy kid and with yeah. Macaulay Culkin, yeah, that's that's the movie for you. Did that kill his career? No. Um, I think after that. He might have done something else. Um, I, just this re- I just remember the Home Alone movies, and those would have been before this. Right. He also did My Girl. He did uh, Home Alone in 1990, I guess. He did uh, – yeah, the, the other ones that he did after that was like Richie Rich was pretty big. You remember oh, that? Yeah. That was 94. Yeah, right. And then I think after that, he didn't do anything for like nine years after Richie Rich. He's one of those child actors that had a hard time, you know. Oh, yeah. Transitioning into adult acting. Like his last three movies in the 90s, they were all done in 94. Getting Even with Dad, The Page Master, and Richie Rich, they were all nominated for Raspberry Awards and Stinkers. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yep. There's a Golden Raspberry Award for Worst Actor. Oh. There's Stinker's Bad Movie Awards for Worst Actor. So he was nominated. Those three movies he did in the 90s, yeah. which he didn't do anything else until 2003, those were all nominated for Golden Raspberry Awards and for Stinker's Bad wow. Movie Awards. So I think, yeah, that's that's kind of what, you know, yeah. killed his career as a child actor, I guess. So The Good Son's not so not too bad, I guess. No, that was nominated for an MTV Movie Award for Best Villain. Wow, huh. which is not. Uh, it's a really, it's a really good movie. I recommend it. Yeah, but and you know, I think like when you think about movies like The Omen, or you know, it's like you you kind of wonder how is this going to end because your the parents cannot kill this kid. I mean, that's their kid. So what are they going to do? So it's sort of a I don't know. It just sort of conveys this helpless feeling, I guess. You know that parents feel like. Just, just in in everyday situations, like you're taking a baby to a restaurant, and you, you know, and then the baby cries, and everybody's looking at you, and you, it's like, well, I don't know what to do. Yeah, usually one of the parents has to leave the restaurant with the kid or something. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. But you know, it, it, which I I relate. I understand. I'm sure you must have been in that situation before, and I guess. I may be one of those people who kind of looks over just to see what's going on. I, I, I don't give people the stink eye or go like, oh, yeah. waiter, can I can I move my table? Or, or, uh, um, or if you, you're on an airplane with, and then some guy comes in, and you've got a baby in your lap, and some guy comes and sits next to you, and he's like, oh, great. Yeah, that, that happens. Um, usually I don't really care about being a baby that's going to cry because I can always put earplugs, but it's more like – Babies are little sickness machines, okay? <laughs> like, at least until they reach, like, four or five, they're always sick. They always have it, snot it, coming out. Well, they always have phlegm. Not when they're a baby. It's when they start going to, like, daycare and school. That's yeah. When, yeah, cause uh, they don't get it at home. They just they get that from other kids. I managed to escape getting uh, – uh, what's that thing that you get? I'm trying to find the, the – I don't want to use the box. wrong name, but – Chicken pox. Yeah. Like, I got chicken pox when I was 17. Yeah. I had escaped having chicken pox throughout my childhood. I never had it. And then once I remember uh, going on a train to go to college, and I remember there were two kids in the seat adjacent to mine on the other side of the aisle, and they had the little spots on their bodies, and they were, like, you know, fidgeting and running around and, you know, Mm -hmm. doing things. And I remember, I was like, oh, I guess those kids have chicken pox. Oh, shucks. I guess uh, I should probably stay away from them. And then two weeks later, I had chicken pox. Yeah. And it was really bad because when you have it at that age, it's yeah. it's harder to get rid of it. Yeah. And also, I got a really rare kind of ophthalmic chicken pox where one of those little things appears inside your eye. Oh, like one of those red spots appears yeah. on your eye and you have to put this ointment inside your eye and it's oh, really like, ah, oh, 
Yeah, I can't. I I don't like to touch my eye for anything. Yeah. So I don't think I would ever be able to wear contact lenses or anything. So when you have to actually put ointment in your eye, oh, that's, that, that's so weird. That is terrible. But so they, yeah, that was not fun. Chicken pox now, but there was a new one that Jennifer and I discovered because we got it, and it's like, oh, they're like the nurse was like, I can't believe that you got this because like adults don't usually get it. It's called hand, foot, and mouth disease. And you get all these hmm. painful bumps all over your hands and your feet and and inside of your mouth. Uh, oh, like these little ulcers in your in your tongue and your mouth. Oh, that's yeah. horrible. But I, we didn't get it in the mouth, but we definitely had them on the backs of our hands and the bottoms of our feet, which made it hard to walk around. Oh, and, that's and, horrible. And it lasted for like two weeks, and we both got Jeez. it at the same time. You know, right after Joey got it from preschool. Yeah, well, that's kids for you. I mean, once you get older, you kind of knock all those things. And, like, I mean, if you're really careful and if you live in a lovely state like Arizona or California where the weather is good all around and you take care of what you eat, you can go, like, for years without getting a single cold. And it's like sometimes I I wonder about that. I was like, oh, it's been, like, two years since I've got a cold. Uh, I must be doing something right. Yeah, it's Um, it's good to if you can ever, like, if you can ever stop and and uh, and appreciate the fact that you're not sick, because most of the time people only appreciate being healthy when they're sick. You know, appreciate the time. That's right. Healthy. Yeah, you just take it for granted otherwise. So one of the only movies that really does kill the kids is that Village of the Damned, where Christopher Reeves has a bomb that he brings to a schoolhouse. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I had you say, well, they can't it. kill the kids. Yes, they can. <laughs> well, they can't kill their own kids. Right. Yeah. It's, it's just that the kids are part alien, so they're not entirely human. That's but, true. Uh, well, and in, in, in the good, uh, the bad seed, right? The girl, the girl gets struck by lightning at the end of the movie. Spoilers. Uh, they said that in the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I guess you know that that's. I guess I don't need to watch it anymore. But, um, yeah, so that's Innocence. And that was G, H, and Y for A to Z of horror. Yeah, yeah. And so next time around we're going to be – and we've actually got this in the schedule. So I know we've been talking about the Hellraiser Bloodline commentary a lot, but uh, that's going to be our next episode. And and then after that we'll be doing Clive Barker's A through Z of horror uh, with J, K, and L. And we, mm-hmm. we'll have an episode about the body book, hopefully. And uh, after that, probably Gods and Monsters audio commentary. All right. Well, that sounds good. And I think there may be something that I would just want to mention here at the end of the episode. Uh, what did our listeners think of the No Clyde Barker episode? Did you guys like it? I mean, was it something that uh, you would like to see us pursue more tangential topics to discuss in the podcast sometimes. Uh, I mean, the the thing about A to Z of horror is that it allows us to talk a lot about other movies that are not related to Clive Barker. So I'm having a lot of fun with this series and I think it really expands on what we can talk and our own experiences um, in this podcast. So let us know what you thought about that. No Clive Barker episode. That would really be a good feedback to have. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd I'd like to hear that too. Just um, I know I think that we had a couple of comments, but I'd like to, I'd like to see more about what people thought and if that's you know if that if if they think that's okay or are we you know stepping out of bounds, going too far. Well, we're doing it for free um, for the most part. <laughs> yeah, and I know we have a Kickstarter, but uh, yeah, yeah, so we we're doing this weekly now. So there's a lot of room for experimentation, yeah. and uh, you know, it's it's always fun to talk about other things other than Clive Barker because sometimes it can get a little, I don't know, you can get a little burned out of just hearing all about Clive Barker every week. But uh, yeah, yeah, let us know. Yeah, and this podcast having no beginning will have no end. You can find the show notes for this page and lots of Clive Barker news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the Send Voicemail tab on the right. Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at Occupy Midian. Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, Pocket Cast, Google Play, and Double Twist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. 
Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.